Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day and this opportunity. Lord, I believe that you want to do a work in our lives here today. So Lord, start with my life and work in all of us. We have an opportunity today to walk home light and free. May that be our reality in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing our series from the book of Mark. And today, specifically, we're starting in Mark chapter 2. Now, this, this particular message today is it's such a burden to me. And I, and I always feel, whenever I come to it, as though there's no way I can do this justice. Because this is such a powerful story. And, and you know, that it's like your favorite passages. you just like, ah, I don't even want to talk about that. It's too good. But this is a powerful story. And I pray that God will open it up to us today as we go. Mark chapter 2, verse 1, we find these words. And again, he, Jesus, entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Okay, so we've talked about, and we mentioned it a little bit last Sabbath, how the book of Mark doesn't fool around. It gets right to business. He doesn't tell a nice long story about Jesus' childhood or, or give us some insight into Mary and Joseph and all of that. He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't even talk in detail about how Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. He just says he was tempted, and he was out there with the animals, and then he came back. He wants to get to something, and he's moving forward with energy, and he moves forward so quickly that already by chapter 2, we're already talking about again. He did this again. So to really get the context for what we want to do today, we need to go back to chapter 1, back to the big claim statement of Jesus Begins in verse 14, it says, Now after John was put in pre- prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. It's a big claim. It's a big statement he's saying. First of all, he's saying the prophecies have been fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. And then he follows it up by saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Then he gives instructions. You are to repent and believe in the good news. So just anybody coming along and saying those words, it's like, "Mm, I don't know if you know what you're talking about. But then Mark goes on to show how Jesus demonstrated that he had the authority to say these words. And he demonstrates it in four ways. We talked about this last Sabbath, and I just want to review it with you again so you remember. First of all, the very next story, Jesus goes out by the Sea of Galilee, and he calls Peter and Andrew and James and John. And these four men leave their profession behind them and follow Jesus. Now, you have to have some sort of authority about you for a person to walk away from all that they're doing and follow you, but Peter and Andrew, James and John, see this in Jesus, and they walk after him. And so what is demonstrated here is Jesus has authority to call He has authority to call followers. And that authority still is real today because Jesus still calls all of you, follow me. So number one, he has authority to call. The very next story that takes place is Jesus in the synagogue and he stands up to teach. And as he's teaching them in the synagogue, he blows their mind. There's something different about the way he teaches. And when he's done, they say, what is this new teaching? He teaches as one with authority not as the teachers of the law. So demonstrated in this is his second authority. He has the authority to teach. But then in that same encounter, suddenly a man cries out in the synagogue. He has an unclean spirit. He has a demon. And he says, I know who you are, son of the Most High God. Have you come to torture us before our time? And Jesus says, be silent. Come out of him. And the man shrieks, and the demon comes out of him, and the people are astonished again. He said, who is this? He even has authority over demons. So that's his third authority. Authority, uh, authority to call, authority to teach, authority over demons. Then after they leave the synagogue, Jesus goes to the home of Peter. This is all in the first chapter of Mark. He keeps it moving. He goes to the home of Peter, and Peter's mother-in-law is sick in bed. So Jesus reaches out, takes her hand, lifts her up, and she is made well, so well, in fact, not just feeling a little better, 
So well, in fact, she begins to serve them. She begins to wait on them. That's healed, right? And he demonstrates his fourth authority, authority over disease. So he has authority to call, authority to teach, authority over demons, and authority over disease. But now when we get to chapter 2, Jesus is going to claim another authority. And this is a big claim that he's about to make, and he will make it in this story. Now, the rest of chapter 1 goes on. He preaches in Galilee. Then he cleanses the leper. That's like the ultimate of healing. And we come then to chapter 2. So we start again, Mark chapter 2. And again, Jesus entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was there. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Now, we might be tempted at this point to say this was one of the most successful times in Jesus' ministry because you look at it and there's a crowd. In fact, the place is busting at the seams. And that's how we tend to think sometimes, that, that, a, that a massive following reflects success. Now, I'm not saying that, that uh, it isn't good if there's a lot of people, but one of the things to remember about this, you'll see this as this develops, there's a lot of people there that are just coming to kind of look and see and figure it out. That's great. That's an opportunity to bring them along, but the truth is some of the people in the room that day in about three years are going to be shouting, crucify him. And in fact, the moment when Jesus is at his peak of glory, his greatest success, there'll hardly be anybody left following him. So don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged if success as the world measures it doesn't feel like it's happening for you. Stay faithful to what God has given you like Jesus did, and your great success will come. We go on, verse 3. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. One of the powerful things about this story is, is the imagery of it that it creates, the drama, the, the, the visualization that you can do of it. Now, now, I'm not an expert on roofs in that era, so I don't know exactly how it works, but here you've got four guys, they're bringing a friend. They take him up to the roof. They tear through the roof. One of the things we don't hear is how the homeowner felt about the whole experience, whether he thought twice about inviting Jesus. Tears through the roof. They lower him down. It's a powerful moment. And I want you to reflect for a minute on the four friends. What would cause four friends to do this for someone else? Now, maybe if you kind of felt sorry for the guy, you might be willing to drag him to the door, and you're like, oh, sorry, man, it's, it's all full. If he weren't so heavy, maybe we'd have gotten here in time to get a seat, but there's, there's nowhere. But that's all right. You just, you just wait here. I'm sure Jesus will come by on his way out. We, we have stuff to do. You know, you might do that if you just felt a little, but what does it take? To muscle the guy, after you carry him there, muscle him all the way up to the roof, tear through the roof, and lower him down in front of Jesus. I want to suggest to you it takes two things. Number one is love. You don't do that for somebody you don't love. But when the love of God is in your heart, and it is somebody you really care about, you will do all kinds of inappropriate things to get them taken care of, won't you? Yeah. Yeah. Number two is faith. You're not going to do that unless you actually believe putting him in front of Jesus is going to make a difference in his life, right? Love and faith. And I want to say, if you've got love and faith in your heart for your friends, you truly are a good friend. And I want to add to that this reality, that this speaks very strongly to the power of intercession on behalf of one another. In fact, it'll speak even more strongly as we go on here and read verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith. Whose faith? The faith of the four, not the faith of the man. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. I want to suggest to you that this is as strong an encouragement to engage yourself in intercessory prayer as there possibly could be. Because here, 
Jesus is receiving the faith of the four and giving the blessing to the one. Do you see that? The one may or may not be ready to receive it, but God honors the faith of the four on behalf of the one. So I want to encourage you, do not become weary in the ones you're praying for because Jesus honors your faith. Do not give up. When he saw the faith of the four, he turned to the one and said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now we hear that and we don't, it doesn't necessarily stick out to us because we associate forgiveness of sin with Jesus, as we should. But I want you to understand how incongruent this statement was in the context. They had already seen Jesus demonstrate his authority over disease. So there was some expectation that something good might happen for this man, but suddenly something else happened. Now let me tell you how I think it happened in my mind. I think in that moment, Jesus is with the crowd. He's teaching the crowd. You've got the noise up above, and all of a sudden, here comes this man down. And Jesus, I think, in that moment is is just thrilled and overwhelmed with the faith and the love of these friends who believe that getting their friend in front of Jesus is going to make a difference. And I think in that moment, for a moment, it was Jesus and the five, and then he looks down at the man, and I believe in that moment, the crowd just sort of fades away for Jesus because he has that ability to be present with you, all right? Not present with the crowd. He can be present, and now by the Holy Spirit, with all of us individually at the same time. But here he is in this moment. He's in the flesh, and I believe he's present with that man in that moment in a way that stirs his heart and he looks beyond the fact that the man is paralyzed to the deepest need in the man's heart. And the very first thing the man needs addressed is not that he can't walk, it's that he needs forgiveness. And he says, looking into the man's heart, I believe without thought to the crowd, son, your sins are forgiven. What a powerful moment. But this claim that Jesus is making inherently by saying your sins are forgiven is big. He's claiming authority here. Verse 6, And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Okay. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's true, isn't it? They are rightly questioning in this moment, how can this man make this statement? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So they're not wrong. But in order for Jesus to be able to say, son, your sins are forgiven, what has to be true about Jesus? He has to be connected with God, doesn't he? This is one of those moments where Jesus is claiming divinity in a way that makes them all very uncomfortable. That's why they use the term, why does he speak blasphemy? It goes on, verse 8. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? Jesus asked the best questions. If you're reading through the Bible, pay attention to any of the questions he asks, because they always turn you on your head. There's the time when they're trying to trap Jesus, and they come to him and say, we know that you judge everything right. Tell us, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So Jesus says, show me a coin. They hold it up, and he asks them a question. Do you remember what it is? He says, whose inscription's on that coin? And they say, Caesar's. And in essence, he says, hey, if you're going to use his money, I guess you're going to pay him taxes, right? (laughs) He turns it around. And then the other time when uh, they come to him after he has cleared the temple and things like that, and they say, by what authority do you do these things? 
Jesus is like, okay, you want to play the authority game? Well, let me ask you a question. John's baptism, was it from God or from man? And they go off and they're like, ah. if we say from God, then he'll say, yeah, why didn't you believe in him? If we, if we say from man, that's not a good idea because the people considered him a prophet. So they come back and they say, I don't know. And so Jesus says, okay, you're okay not knowing? Then I won't tell you how I do these things. He turns us. You see, we always want to outsmart God, don't we? But Jesus doesn't let it happen. This is another one of those times. And Jesus asks an amazing question. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? All right. To anybody in that room, I suppose anybody could say those words. But there's nobody in the room that day that could make it happen, right? None of the scribes could say, your sins are forgiven and the man's sins are forgiven, or say, get up and walk, and the man would get up and walk, right? None of them have the power within themselves to do it. They do not have the authority to achieve this. He goes on, verse 10, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Now, I, I want to break this down for you just a second here because we, we uses the word in this translation, power to forgive sins. Now, there are two words in Greek that can be translated power. The one that appears here is, I'm sure you'll recognize it when I put it up here, um, exousion is the word. It's from the word exousia. It means power, but it also means authority. Back in the previous chapter when they were saying, what is this new teaching with authority? It's this word. What is this new teaching with exousion? So basically what this word, there's another word, dunamis, that means power. We get our word dynamite from that. All right, so boom, yeah, that kind of power. But exousion is, is a different kind of saying. It's, it's sort of like power associated with the one saying it. So, so basically what it means is the person who has exousion can say it and can make it happen. So it's the authority to bring it about. Okay? So this is what the centurion understood about Jesus. You remember that? The encounter with the centurion. He says, uh, Jesus says, well, I'll come to your house and heal him. And he says, oh, you don't have to do that. You have exousion. You have authority. Just speak the word and he's well. I understand how authority works. Just say the word. And Jesus is amazed at his faith. But that's, that's what Jesus is saying here. He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority and power in order to forgive sin, so that you will know that I can do this. He said to the paralytic, verse 11, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So this is like, boom, mind's blown. What in the world is going on here? Who is this man? Jesus can do what we can't. We need to understand that. Because in that question, there are two things that he says that we and of ourselves are not capable of achieving. We can't forgive the sin. We can't make the man well. Now, we can care. We can, we can do our best to, to help the processes that God has, has established within the body to bring healing, but we can't just lay our hand short of the Holy Spirit working through us and have that transpire, right? But Jesus is saying, I can. I have the authority. Now, I want to talk, I want to go back to this issue of authority here because there's an important difference in what's taken place here. Jesus has claimed authority to forgive sin. Now, I want to go back to the other four authorities of Jesus. So, first of all, he claims the authority to call. Why does he have authority to call? Jesus has authority to call because he's become head of our race. What I mean by that was Adam was the originally created head, but he fell into sin. And so Jesus came as what the Bible refers to as the second Adam. 
He comes and restores us to where we were supposed to be. So he has the right to call us because he is first among us. He is our head, head of race. So he has the authority to call. Secondly, he has the authority to teach. Why does he have authority to teach? Because we don't know everything and he does. Okay? So that's what he has that we don't. Now third, he has authority over demons. Why is that? Because they know exactly who he is. He is the son of the father. And they do not have authority over him. He has authority over them. Number four, he has authority over disease. One of the amazing things about Jesus, so, so in the Old Testament, they created all these laws of clean and unclean. Now, the reason those laws were there was because in a time when they didn't understand the details of, of germs and, and all of those different things, that coming in contact with sick or other things could result in sickness in a person. So, so they used these rules of clean and unclean, and you had to stay away from the unclean, and the unclean had to wash, and they would be restored the ultimate scenario was leprosy. That was the ultimate unclean. The problem in those days was we as humans, if we touch something unclean, if I touch a germy surface, if you want to use it in our day, I don't make the germs die, do I? The germs come off onto me, right? That's how it is for us. But that's not how it is for Jesus. When Jesus touches unclean, unclean doesn't make him unclean. He makes unclean clean, right? So nobody could go to a leper and lay their hands on them, and the leper would be clean. No, you lay your hands on the leper, you join him in unclean. But Jesus lays his hand on the leper, and the leper is cleansed. You see the difference? It's the reality of who Jesus is. Now, so these four authorities of Jesus, I would suggest to you, these are innate authorities. They go with who he is. He came as the second Adam. That gives him the right to call. He knows. That gives him the right to teach. He has authority over demons because he is over demons. He has the authority over disease because unclean does not bother him. He drives unclean away. This is just who Jesus is. But he's claimed one more authority, hasn't he? He has claimed the authority to forgive sin. How does Jesus have the authority to forgive sin? You see, this is where the question in its genius really comes to light. He says, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or take your mat and walk? Now, if we look at this, we'll say, well, Jesus to say, take your mat and walk, that's an innate reality of who he is. He brings wholeness to anything he touches. So he makes the man whole because he is whole. So that one's not hard for Jesus to say at all, is it? But what about when that moment when he looks at the man, he looks at his greatest need, and he says to him, your sins are forgiven. What will Jesus have to do in order to gain the authority to forgive the sin? You see, from the beginning up until that moment and even on beyond that moment, forgiveness of sin is a promise, not a completed work. God is forgiving sin based on the promise of what Jesus will do. So if you want to think about it this way, in that moment when Jesus looks at that man and says, Son, your sins are forgiven, He is promising him that he will go all the way to the cross and die. So when he says, which is easier to say, take your mat and walk or your sins are forgiven? Well, for us, we can't say either. But for Jesus, one is just something that's part of his reality. For the other, he will have to die. It's a powerful moment. It's almost too big to comprehend what has taken place here, that the mercy of Jesus is so strong that in that moment He promises to go down the road. Now, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, we see, quoting from the Old Testament, these words that explains this very thing. Verse 5, Therefore, when Jesus came into the world, He said, Sacrifices and offering you did not desire. So what he's saying there is there were all these sacrifices, but they were to point forward to the sacrifice that mattered. The actual killing of the lamb did not do away with sin. 
It pointed forward to the promise. But a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, To do your will, O God. This is the commitment of Jesus to forgive the sins of humanity. The sacrifices of bulls and lambs and all of those things. That didn't forgive sin. It pointed to the promise. Mark chapter 14 is the moment where Jesus is wrestling. The Hebrews text says, I have come to do your will. Now, Mark chapter 14, Jesus is in the garden, verse 35. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will but what you will. Jesus couldn't back down now. He'd promised the man. Jesus couldn't back down now. Do you remember when He goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration and there's Moses and Elijah and they appear to Him? Do you know what happens to them if He doesn't do this? They lose their place. They are in heaven on a promise that Jesus will go through with the sacrifice. Jesus faces that hour, and in that hour He says, not my will, but yours be done. He keeps the promise, and the man's sins are taken away. Now what I want to tell you today is, no longer is our hope in the promise. Our hope now is in the completed work. The Lord has died and is risen again. And our faith is in an accomplished work, not in a work to come. And that grace for forgiveness extends to you today. Now, I can see you with my eyes, but I can't see down inside you. But that's okay. I couldn't do anything for you even if I could. So the Lord doesn't let us have information that's not going to do us any good. So I can't see what's in your heart. And maybe I can see if if you could use some healing. But probably I can't. But that's okay. Even if I could see it in and of myself, I can't do anything for you. But Jesus can Jesus is able to see you. Now, I don't want you to think about Jesus seeing us right now. I want you to think about Jesus having the moment with you. Your friends are lowering you down. You're the paralyzed one lowering you down, and Jesus is seeing you. And he has two messages for you. Your sins are forgiven. Be healed. I believe you can know the experience of this man today. Now, I can't promise you that whatever ails you in a physical sense, he will take away today. I can promise you he will take it away ultimately. But he might take it away today. But the thing I can promise you is that he will forgive your sin. The sacrifice has been made. The promise has become the reality. Are you wanting forgiveness of sins today? Do you want to walk out of here cleansed, clean, and free? That is the offer of Jesus. Do you want healing in your body, in your spirit, in your mind, in your heart? As we close today, Pastor Justin's going to sing a song for us. And I've asked a number of pastors to join us here at the front. And we've got some oil. Nothing special about it except the fact that it symbolizes the Holy Spirit. 
And we want to anoint you today. And we want to say a prayer with you, a very simple prayer. By God's grace, your sins are forgiven. Be healed in the name of Jesus. If you want that in your life today, then the invitation is, as Justin sings, is for you to come and join one of us here in the front. And we will anoint you. We will say that simple prayer. You don't need to confess anything. Don't even bother. I can't help you anyway. All right? I got nothing for that. But I can pray and help you look to the one who has already done the work to forgive your sins. So I want to ask those I've invited. I've, I've invited Pastor Tim and, and Alicia is here to join us. Pastor Alicia come and Maria is an elder. Uh, she's going to join us as well. Mark Niemeyer is our head elder. Come on up here, gentlemen. And I've asked, uh, uh, I've, I've also asked my good friend Dennis Ross to come and join us. He was a ministerial director for our region for a long time. He's going to join us here. Come and join any one of us. It's, it's God doing the work, not us. We're just here to pray with you. Pastor Justin's going to sing forgiveness of sin and healing. Come and receive from the Lord. my raging sea walk with me through fire and heal all my disease I trust in you I trust That you're my portion I believe you're more than enough for me Jesus, you're all I every moment you come my raging seas you walk with me through fire and heal all my disease I trust
Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold my world in your hand. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold my world in your hand. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold my world in your hand. Oh, I believe that you're my healer. I believe you are all I I believe you're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I
Surely the Spirit of the Lord is in this place. And He has moved upon our hearts today. And for every heart that is open, no matter what our course has been, what our road has been, the offer of forgiveness stands and cannot be taken away because it is based on the work that Jesus has already done. It is your privilege today to go from this place with an unburdened soul, for you have laid it all before the Lord. He has honored your faith. He will bring us healing. He will bring us hope. He will bring us courage. His ultimate fulfillment of all things is to come, and we wait in faithfulness for that day. But as of today, let me say, Jesus announced, the kingdom of God is near. And so I say to you today, welcome to the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your grace is sufficient. Our need is severe. Forgive us today for all of our failings. Look upon us with the eyes of heaven. Know everything and love us anyway. And out of that love and grace, grant us forgiveness and healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.